Welcome to Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Tuesday, May 23rd. I'm your host, Tom Moore. The Indiana game is in 102 days. The game against Michigan in 186 days. But before those games are being played, we got to talk about a very busy summer of recruiting for Ohio State. We're just about a week or so away from the start of camps at Ohio State, which is always a very eventful uh, and fun time to get to see a lot of prospects in person at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center. And then also you get all those June official visits. So we're heading into a very busy season on the recruiting calendar. Al Kletman of BuckeyeHuddle.com just wrote a really interesting uh, column for our subscribers on the Huddle Board, talking about five, the five biggest recruiting storylines for the Buckeyes heading into the summer. We're going to be talking about just three of those here. You're going to, if you want the other two, and they're pretty good ones, pretty interesting ones, you're going to have to find those on the Huddle Board at BuckeyeHuddle.com. But Alex... I really wanted to focus on the defensive side of the ball right now because it feels like that's where the Buckeyes have the most work to do right now. And you started your thing with, you know, I don't know if you had them ranked, but this feels like one of the biggest ones right now. Will Ohio State land the top Ohio defensive backs? And I'm sure people right now are saying, okay, Aaron Scott, okay, Bryce West. But, you know, there's, there's some more defensive back targets that they've got to bring in this summer as well. Yeah, I mean, they've offered four Ohioans in the class and Bryce West and Aaron Scott – um, from Glenville and Springfield, respectively, are kind of the two big fish. But, you know, they got Reggie Powers, uh, safety. You know, there's some questions. Is he a take? Is he not a take? Um, you know, well, I don't want to give away too much, but uh, I, I think he'll end up in the class. Um, I guess I, I gave away a lot. But uh, to Ryan Nichols is, uh, you know, he's, he's a fast riser. Penn State, Michigan, uh, Pitt. Um, you know, Cincinnati, Kentucky, they had all offered him. Ohio State recently offered without him. Notre Dame had offered as well. Um, you know, they had they had all offered him. Ohio State, I thought they were going to make him camp. Uh, they decided to just pull the trigger. They had seen enough. I think Ryan Day, I know, uh, I think it was Tim Walton was at his school, and then Ryan Day saw him at the, the, UA, uh, the UA camp in Columbus uh, that he had the luxury of being at thanks to his son RJ being – a prospect attending. So, you know, those are four defensive backs in the state of Ohio. Position of need, you got to land them. I mean, reality, as long as you want all of them, you got to land all four, in my opinion. There's, like, no excuse for not. Um, you're talking about Aaron Scott and Bryce West, two guys who grew up, you know, rooting for Ohio State. They Springfield, I wouldn't say, has been, like, the most Ohio State-friendly program, but I also can't totally remember a guy from there that Ohio State really went all in on the way they have with Aaron. Uh, in, in recent history, and then, you know, Bryce West, um, Glenville guy, you know, those two alone, to me, just, you got to get them, because, and, and even with Nichols, the alternative with those three potentially could be that they go to Michigan, and that's okay if you're, you feel good about your evaluation and you decide to pass and things like that, but I think these three guys are three guys that Ohio State really wants, and if you lose them to your rival, who you've had trouble beating the last couple of years, and who knows what will happen this year? I, I think that's a big problem. So I would say those three at cornerback are definitely must-gets because I think that position needs to be restocked and, and all the reasons we talked about. Reggie Powers, I wouldn't call him a must-get, but they offered a couple months back. I mean, that, that says it all to me. They could have made that kid camp. He would have done it. Um, I, I think, though, he'll end up in the class, and uh, I think they like him a lot. And one thing that's really interesting about that secondary, I mean, I, you can think of a bunch of corners off the top of your head, but even safeties as well, that's a spot where, for whatever reason, Ohio State has had a lot of late flips. You know, Clark Phillips flips, uh, Jordan Battle flips. They had a couple guys last year, Deshaun Johnson flips last year. I mean, they, they had a bunch of, they've had a bunch of guys who were in the class and they're out of the class. Now, one thing those guys all have in common is they're not Ohio kids. So it would seem like, in addition to the, hey, you need these good local players, you also, when you get Ohio kids, you don't tend to have the Ohio kids flip. It's the national prospects who tend to flip. So it feels like that might be sort of an added layer of you really got to have, this has to be sort of the base of your class because once they're in, you, I, am I wrong? It feels like once they're in, they're in. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I mean, you, you think about it like Clark Phillips left because Jeff Halfley left and um, Jordan Battle left because Urban Meyer stepped down. Um, you know, Dijon was a little bit of a different situation, but like, I guess what I'm saying is while relationships matter with the guys like the Bryce Wests and the, and the Aaron Scotts, it's still Ohio state. Like 
they just trust that Ohio State's going to bring in a good coach to replace a Tim Walton or a Perry Eliano or whoever, you know, Jim Knowles, whoever would leave if that were the case. So, I, you know, it's close to home. It's the school they grew up rooting for. It's They're not going there. While the coach, the relationship with the coaches is important, it's not the reason they're going there, whereas I think the Jordan Battle relationship with Urban Meyer and the, uh, the Clark Phillips relationship with Jeff Halfley really were the drivers in getting those guys from Florida and California, respectively. All right, next position up, and this is a position where the Buckeyes didn't lose commitments last year, but they had a bunch of guys who it felt like the sort of consensus was they were looking really good for them, and then suddenly they weren't. Right at the end of the cycle, they went from, you know, are you going to get three or four defensive ends to you got one defensive end in the class of 2023. So your second storyline will was, will the Buckeyes be left at the altar again at defensive end? What is, how is that position uh, recruiting shaping up for you right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but it, it feels eerily similar, similar to last year. I would say maybe there was more eggs and fewer baskets last year than there are this year. But, I mean, it just doesn't seem like the Nets that wide cast. I also think this is this year is not an amazing defensive line year. Um, but the ends they're in on are, are good ones. And I think, you know, you talk about guys like Dylan Stewart or Marquise Lightfoot. Uh, Booker Pickett's kind of like a kind of like a hybrid linebacker uh, and uh, e- edge player. If Ohio State ever puts that into into effect in their defense, uh, Darian Mayo, Elias Rudolph, and and Edric Houston. I mean, those are those are probably what is that one, two, three, four, five, six guys. I mean, if they could land two of those six that I just mentioned, I think that would be a win. I think three would be like you celebrate your pop in the champagne. Um, Because those are all really good players who I think um, would would help bolster that room big time and bring Ohio State defensive end play back to where it needs to be. Uh, So I I just, you know, right now you can make – what I wrote in the article is that you can make the argument that, like, while Ohio State, you could say, is like a top one or two school for each of those guys, you can also easily make the argument for the field over Ohio State for any of them. Um, which is a little scary at, at this point. So I think the month of June is going to be critical. I think come July 1st, they're going to be sitting there kind of knowing if they don't have commitments in the hop already, knowing exactly where they stand. But I will say the mistakes they made last year with, you know, kind of the Mateo Uagalele and Keon Keeley and Damon Wilsons of the world, I don't think those are going to be repeat mistakes this year. I think they're going to act a lot earlier and they're not going to just – put all their eggs in the basket of hoping that some of these big national guys just end up coming to Ohio state. Yeah. It feels like the recruiting landscape is so different every year at this point with the changes of NIL and the changes of the transfer portal and all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, Ohio state has an unproven defense last year. And then, you know, there may be more of a proven defense this year. And then there's the perpetual Larry Johnson rumors. It's like the landscape sort of is changing at the recruiting at that position and a lot of other spots, but yeah, it does feel like, you know, you sort of sort of address last year's issue and try not to make the same mistake again this year. Uh, last year, they did not go real deep at linebacker last year. They, the only true linebacker they brought in in the 2023 class was Arvell Reese. So this year, that's only a position where they really they really only play two linebackers, two true linebackers for the most part in, you know, their base defense. So I guess the question is, how deep did, how deep do they have to go at linebacker this year? Because you only added one last year, so you'd figure, oh, you need to go deeper. But they only play two. So what are they going to do at linebacker this year? Yeah, well, they have Peyton Pierce and Garrett Stover in the class already. So I think the great thing is, you know, I think those two are rock solid. I don't think they're going anywhere. And I think now you could kind of sit back and be a little bit more selective and go a little uh, big, big game hunting. And I think that that's exactly what Jim Knowles and James Laurinaitis are doing. Um, You know, there's, there's four guys who I would say kind of fall into the, we would take them. And honestly, I think they, I, I, while I think they want to take three linebackers in this class, I wouldn't. If they could get two of these guys, I think they potentially might take four. I don't know. I don't. I think it will be three. But Kingston Valamuasa from St. John Bosco out in California, been to Ohio State probably at least five times on his own dime over the last few years. Um, it's USC, Ohio State, Notre Dame. To me, I know Notre Dame's in it and the academics, and you know they do pretty well in California, but. 
I think it will end up being Ohio State or USC in the end. And it's just, you know, can Ohio State, with a good USC program, can you pull a kid from a California powerhouse away from USC? That's always tough. Uh, but I think they got a great shot. Uh, the other three, Sammy Brown and Edwin Spillman. When I wrote the article, I would say, so I still think Edwin Spillman is going to be tough to pull from Tennessee. He's a Tennessee native. I think that's where he's probably going to end up, but he's making an official visit in June. Sammy Brown, when I wrote the article, I basically said it was going to be similar uphill battle. And I still think it's a little bit of an uphill battle, but I've gotten some intel since that article. And I'll just say, I think that Ohio State, I think Georgia's the team to beat. I had Clemson maybe as the challenger to Georgia. I think Ohio State's actually the challenger to Georgia, which is huge because that's a kid who, you know, depending on what service you're looking at, I mean, I guess he's a, he's a composite five-star. 24-7 themselves have him as the number five overall player in the country. The composite has him as number 14 overall. Um, so you're looking at a guy who might be the top linebacker in this class. He's from Georgia. Again, Georgia's going to be tough to beat here. But I think if anyone has a shot, it might be Ohio State. So I'm changing my tune a little bit on that one to no chance to you're telling me there's a chance. Um, and the last guy I'll talk about, who I think is kind of a – I don't even want to say plan B, but I just think when you talk about the other three guys, this guy might just be like a notch below as far as caliber of players. Nicholas Rodriguez, St. Thomas Aquinas, obviously a school Ohio State has had a long history with. The Bosa's, Deron Carter, um, there's someone else, uh, Damon Arnett. Uh, they had Trevon Grimes, obviously, for a year. Um, so they've done pretty well at St. Thomas Aquinas over the years. There's probably someone I'm missing in there. But um, Nicholas Rodriguez, oh, they have uh, Jordan Lyle in this year's class already committed, running back. So Nicholas Rodriguez is a kid who who many feel in South Florida that he is underranked. He's like a mid-three-star type of guy. Um, and many people feel like he's more of like a lower four-star type of guy. So I think if Ohio State's willing to take him, I think that they're probably the team to beat. But the question will be, I think, are they willing to take him? How do they feel about, you know, those other three guys that I mentioned maybe come middle to end of June? And and then uh, and then I think we'll have their answer based on what they do with Nicholas Rodriguez. But he's a good player. I think he'd be good to pair with the other two. So I feel good about, I, I guess, TLDR, I feel pretty good about uh, – where Ohio State stands at linebacker. All right. So those were the three storylines we were wanted to talk about from your uh, from your column from last week. But I did want to get a quick little update from you. We uh, talked about Jeremiah Smith on uh, a show that I uh, recorded with Kevin. Uh, and there were a bunch of Georgia fans who could not wait to tell us in the YouTube comments how much fun it looked like Jeremiah Smith was having uh, and all the photos from his visit to Georgia, which... I mean, I guess I can't remember a player who did not look like he was having fun on a recruiting photo during an official visit, but whatever. Uh, I guess there there is some increased enthusiasm from the Georgia side of things about the five-star receiver, and, you know, could they maybe flip him from Ohio State? Has your level of concern there on the Ohio State side of things, has that changed at all since that Georgia visit? You know, it hasn't. I'm not going to say a visit can't um, alter someone's thinking, but he's been to Georgia before. He's met Dylan Rayola before. Trust me, Dylan Rayola has talked to him that he's going to Georgia. Like, I just don't think anything's changed from when Kevin and Mark were down there at his school last week when he basically said, and I believe him, that unless something happens with Brian Hartline and Ryan Day with Ohio State, he Ohio State fans have nothing to worry about. And... I just think the relationship's that good with Brian Hartline. I think him and his camp, South Florida Express, they trust Ryan Day and Brian Hartline, especially with offensive players, to develop them. Uh, I mean, just look at the drafts. Look at next year's draft, what that's likely going to look like. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, it speaks for itself. I think Tony did the research. Who was the last Georgia receiver in the first round? I think it was A.J. Green, and he was maybe the only one in, like, the last 40 years drafted in the first round. So, I mean – you know, that's not to say that can't change. Ohio State, when was the last quarterback they had drafted in the first round until Dwayne Haskins went a few years ago? I mean, so things can certainly change, especially as coaching staffs change and, you know, everyone wants to play for Georgia or whatever and Dylan Rayola's there and blah, blah, blah. But I just, I'm not buying it. 
All right, so uh, there you go, Ohio State fans. You can take yourselves from uh, DEFCON 1, maybe to about DEFCON 4 or so. Until, uh, until the ink is dry on the letter of intent, you, never, you can never uh, officially rest. Recruiting never sleeps. Neither does our recruiting staff at BuckeyeHuddle.com. They have been uh, churning out a ton of content. As uh, Alex said, Mark and Kevin were just down south for their Southern Swing. Talked to a couple dozen players. Talked to Kevin on yesterday's show about some of those guys, including some of the names that Alex mentioned here today as well. And uh, Mark has been uh, busy at camps uh, across the state of Ohio over the last couple days. We'll probably, probably try to have him on a little later on in the week to talk about some of that stuff. And then, as I said at the top of the show, heading into uh, Ohio State camp season, heading into official visit season. This is going to be a very busy next month or so at BuckeyeHuddle.com. June used to be the uh, June used to be the off season, the kind of quiet time of the year. No more. It is uh, high high time, uh, high you know re- five star red alert uh, all the time at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Lots of uh, new content, lots of new insight, lots of new uh, insider reports, lots of new analysis, all on the Huddle Board at BuckeyeHuddle.com. So, if your membership might be heading up, coming up uh, at another site, it might be time to uh, you know if you're thinking about making a switch, this would be a great time to make a switch because there is a ton of stuff going on at BuckeyeHuddle.com. That will do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.